outside of Mercer Upfitters, there are no other uh, African American owned Upfitters in the United States. Wow. All right, all right, Hustle Fam, Hustle Fam, we are back with another amazing episode. And I'm currently in the Shy, Shy Town to be exact, with my special guest, Mrs. Rachel Mercer Coleman from Mercer Upfitters. Rachel, Rachel, welcome to Truck and Hustle. Uh, thank you, thank you. A pleasure to be here. Thanks thank for having me. For sure, for sure. So I always love to tell our guests and our audience that the riches are in the niches, right? If you can find a niche, uh, you know, doing something that maybe not everybody else does, you could potentially grow yourself a pretty, pretty decent business. I think that's what you've done here. I'm excited to learn more about Mercer Upfitters, what you guys do, and just kind of get into your story and figure out how you got to where you're at today. Oh, definitely, definitely. This is definitely an, a, a niche business. Um, I, I incorporated Mercer uh, back in 2018. And this is during a time where I was the assistant to uh, the deputy director of fleet and facility management with the city of Chicago. And so um, with, with that role, um, I took on managing of over 13,000 vehicles that oh. the city leased or owned. Okay. And, uh, and just making sure they were in com role compliance and legal compliance. Never set on any contracting, um, uh, for procurement, but just uh, managing the vehicles. And at that time, um, orders would come across our desk. We need 500 strobe lights to go on top to be mounted on these 500 new vehicles we got. Or the city of Chicago is just is, has just bought 500 new police vehicles and they all need to be decaled. They all need sirens. They all need... Um, um, other specifications that are at the market parts added to the vehicles. And it's like, before this role, I didn't realize how intricate um, at the market parts were with vehicles. Right. Um, and then, you know, I'll, I'll leave work and I'll look outside and I'll see a truck go past with a ladder rack on it. Uh, my postal service guy has decals on the car. You know, UPS, Amazon, police, ambulances, um, and then look up in the city of Chicago cars that are all decaled and have lights on them. So it's like, so who actually does this work? How do you actually get into it? And um, where are they? Because um, upfitters don't advertise. Right. You never see a commercial that says, come to such and such upfitters. We're the best upfitter in the in the country right <laughs> that, now. That's a fact. That's a fact. Um, you know, you'll see an oil change commercial. You'll see a car dealership commercial, but you never ever see the aftermarket world. And that is how, for years, how this niche industry has decided to keep it. Mm. The less people know they exist, the more profitable uh, my competitors are. Right. And the longevity is there. If people don't know that this business, uh, upfitting businesses exists, then how would anybody ever take an interest in um, opening up their own upfitting business? That's a fact. You know, we, we uh, I went to a trade school for high school and one of the trades programs automotive. And so automotive repair. And so that is when you think of vehicles and and getting into that world, that is what comes up in, in most basically African-American communities is, okay, you want to be an automotive mechanic or automotive technician. Right. Uh, no one is ever saying, you ever heard of upfitting? <laughs> you ever, you, you know what E-Track is or putting a backup alarm on the vehicle is? Um, it's not discussed because we are unaware of it. Right. We, if you're not in that world, you would have no idea how it's a multi-billion dollar industry. Um, I talk about sometimes uh, with folks who are new to the upfitting world about, uh, you know, the, the ability to have generational wealth. Um, most of my competitors here in Illinois 
have been established for multiple decades, some over a century. So imagine being an upfitter and being in business for over a century where I just found out about upfitting, you know, a couple years ago. <laughs> right, right, right. Facts. <laughs> so imagine growing up in that environment where, you know, you have this one company who's been around for over a century and has been able to pass it down from generation to generation to generation, you know, making over $40 million a month. A month. Mm. It, and it's like, why? Nobody knows about this. Right, right. <laughs> you know, you, 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 because everybody drives home, you drive a car, or if you ride public transportation, you're going to eventually pass a police car. You're going to eventually pass an Amazon truck or a UPS truck or just your, uh, your utility people, people's gas, Nightcore. All of their vehicles have aftermarket parts on them. Right. Where do they go to get all that stuff at? Yeah, yeah. And so they all just need to come over to Mercy. <laughs> that's, that's what they need to do. Man, I love it. I love it. Great, great introduction. Great way to kind of get into the show, right? You talk about, you know, working for the city, having that light bulb moment, looking around you, finding problems and becoming the solution. That's that's where great businesses are built. That's how great businesses are built. Um, so I love that. And, 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 and I'm proud that you were able to to see that and take action on it more importantly. Right. Uh, so, so let's kind of get into your backstory a little bit, kind of let people know like, who you are and, and, and what made you the person that you are today to, to take action on such a business. Right. Uh, so let's kind of go back. You're from Chicago originally from Chicago, born and raised, born and raised. What part of, what part of the shy are you from? Um, Bronzeville area. Okay. Still live there to this day. Okay. So, uh, grew up Catholic. Um, went to, St. Elizabeth graduated from there at uh, elementary school, then transitioned on over to Paul Lawrence Dunbar for high school. After high school, uh, transitioned on over to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, after that, uh, so <laughs> crazy. I, sometimes I think, uh, my, my grandfather used to tell these stories about how he, at one point he was a doctor, at one point he was a lawyer, at one point he was a police officer. And as kids, we would sit down and really like, really believe him. Um, <laughs> and you wouldn't, but, but he had a lot of different jobs over his, the course of the, of the course of his, uh, you know, his professional lifetime. career. Right. Um, but, you know, sometimes I sit back and I laugh at myself. So when I graduated from the University of Illinois, I, uh, received my degree in sports management. Okay. And I went into professional sports. Okay. Uh, working in the front office for uh, the WNBA. Um, at 22 years old, that was, it was a bit too stressful, I guess, mindset for me at that time. So um, left, left that job, decided uh, that I wanted to learn more about radiation therapy. My father uh, passed away back in 04 from colorectal cancer and radiation was was a part of his treatment plan. So I decided to go to radiation therapy school. Got it. I got I could become a radiation therapist. Went to uh, radiation therapy school in Minnesota, um, graduated. Um, but at the same time was when me and my husband decided to start a, a family family. Mm -hmm. And uh, we found out uh, we were pregnant with our daughter at that time. So literally, right as I graduated, as soon as I finished clinicals, here comes the, the new addition. Right. Um, and uh, at that time, with radiation therapy, working, uh, just graduating clinicals, um, and trying to find a, a treatment facility to take me on, knowing that most likely I was going to be on maternity leave within a couple months, right. uh, was an uphill battle. And so... Uh, um, that didn't happen, and uh, our beautiful baby girl was born. Uh, I was blessed enough to be a stay-at-home mom for a year with her, uh, and and so after she turned one, I uh, decided, hey, we got to make a. I have to go back to work, um, and so unfortunately, with radiation therapy, if you're not in it, you get left behind. Right. It's a it's a continuing Evolves. education thing. Yeah, right. it's constantly evolving. It's yeah. constantly evolving, and. Um, 
it's it, the, if you're applying for a position somewhere at, at, at a hospital or a treatment facility and you're like, I've been out for over a year, it's we could just move on to the next candidate. <laughs> Got you. So start applying for jobs. Uh, and this is in Minnesota and end up getting a job with the state of Minnesota in their Department of Public Safety. And at that time, I was dealing with problem drivers. So uh, my job was to um, answer the questions that um, people had about their license uh, eligibility and things of that nature. And I dealt with problem drivers, meaning like habitual DUI p uh, cases and uh, traffic violations. Okay. Um, people who, you know, licenses just good luck with ever getting one ever again. <laughs> right, right, right. Um, and so did that. And then we decided that it was just time for us to, you know, come home. And so I started applying for jobs here with the city of Chicago. And one of them was the vehicle coordinator position. Uh, and you know, applying for jobs with government agencies is just so much red tape and it takes forever to even get a call back and even getting past the bots on their application system. <laughs> Got you. Um, you know, and I learned this while working with, uh, when I was with the state of Minnesota, uh, I had a hiring manager call me back, uh, and say, Hey, we, we really are interested in, in, in calling you in for an interview. However, the system is blocking you for being qualified. I'm, like, I'm not quite, I'm not understanding you. I have multiple degrees. Right. Um, but I didn't stipulate in the application that I can read and do math, but uh, <laughs> really, this is how some of the, and, and this is how I learned like how to apply for jobs online. If, if the, if the application is asking you for a specific answer, answer it back in their language. Yes. I am proficient <laughs> at Multiplication, division, reading, writing, and arithmetic. All, all of the above. <laughs> Along with these two degrees I have around my waist right, right. And, and, a, and a couple thousand dollars worth of college loans. Right, yes, right, I made right. it all the way through there. It's, That's so incredible. I had to, they told me I had to go back into the system, make sure I literally put that into the notes or whatever question box, answer box, Okay. in order to get past their firewall. <laughs> wow, okay. And so from there, once it came time to apply for another government position with uh, another government agency, I was able to maneuver way easier. So got the call from the city. Right. Like, hey, we want to interview for you, you this for this position. Um, that process took about six months. And once I was hired, uh, I stayed in that position that I was hired in as the court, the vehicle coordinator. Um, which basically all I dealt was I just made sure that all the vehicles, uh, like I said, were in compliance legally, that, that they were road safe and that they had all of their proper uh, uh, license plates, insurance, things of that nature, because the cars are going over. They're spreading out across the whole city to different departments, uh, different um, employees, Got it. things of that nature. And so how many vehicles we talk about that you're overseeing at this at, time? At this time, it was about 13,000. Oh, now 13,000, 13,000 vehicles. Okay. And mind you, the city, they're constantly buying more and more and more and more and more and more and more. Yeah. Uh, to the point where now they, they lease the majority of their vehicles cause they're, they're switching them out so often. Right. Um, and so stayed in that position for a year and a half and, uh, at that time, I realized that, you know, sometimes you look around and you'll be like, I deserve more than what is currently being handed to me. Um, I'm wait, this position, I'm, I've outsmarted this position. I can do this in my sleep. Right. And this is before the ability to stay at home and work. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah. And so, and then I'm like, okay, I, we live in Chicago now. I like, Chicago is expensive. And so it's like, I want expensive things as well. So I need to make more money in order to buy the things that I enjoy and provide the life for my children that I would, that I once dreamed about. So I went to uh, the deputy commissioner one day and I said, hey, here's my current pay. I see that there are a couple positions open online. Um, what are my options as far, do you guys, you know, 
is 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 because it's not stipulating if you're hiring from within or if you're going to hire from without. Right. And um, you know, they'll have all these other stipulations on there that like who qualifies for it. Uh, it'd be like you have to be you have to have a a master's in mechanical engineering to manage vehicles, <laughs> but it's to weed. Right. People out. Like sure. if I have a master's, in, I'm going to be an engineer. Right. 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 <laughs> Not going to manage a fleet of vehicles. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> so he's like, yeah, just just submit. If it goes if it goes through HR, then we'll go from there. Because I told him I said I need a raise, or you know I'm going to have to leave this department and look in other departments, you know, to to make sure that um, I am adequately being paid properly. Right. right. And are you so, are you applying for multiple positions or oh yeah I just started searching all the city there. I'm like right. what is I'll open I'll take everything <laughs> <laughs> what is open right you know and, and, what, and what were you being paid at that time Do you at the time as a vehicle coordinator I was being paid fifty five thousand and this was back in two thousand and sixteen okay um so then I started getting calls from other departments because with with municipalities everybody they like to hire within so if you're already in their system. You know the system. Right. So you all you have to do is submit the application. They're going to check you first before hiring outside. Right. So I started getting calls. So I started letting my bosses know, like, listen, <laughs> Department of Finance is calling. <laughs> yeah, knock me out. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so sat down. Uh, and at that time, the deputy commissioner called me in his office and he needed a new assistant. Okay. And they have the ability to hire their own assistants. It's just like a having a running mate. So if I want to be vice pres president, I go find my own vice president. Gotcha. Uh, and so that they have that uh, uh, ability to do that. And so he said, hey, I need a system. Are you down to me? I said, how much does it pay? <laughs> yeah. Um, he said, it pays a lot more than what you're making now, but you lose your union status. Mm. And so you're, you're going to peak and it will not be any more growth. Right. You got a ceiling. Yep. As opposed to with the union, I'm always growing until I, t till it's time for me to retire. Right. Um, and so, uh, so I took the position and then that's when I was exposed to the upfitting part. Mm. Now it's like, I'm learning about, uh, E-Track. I'm learning about ladder racks. I'm learning about sirens and, and lighting. And now I can speak the verbiage with our vendors. Yeah, I need uh, this roof mount directional light that wig wags amber and pauses red. And, you know, the verbiage is now coming. I'm, I'm knowing every part that's going on these vehicles now. Um, and I'm also seeing that there is no minority participation anywhere. At all. Not one minority business, not one minority salesperson. Nothing about how many vendors uh, is this work kind of spread across? If you could, so at that time, at that time, this was uh, so how it works is for the larger contracts that the city owns. So the vehicles that the city that they own, they work directly with the upfitter, and so those vehicles are the police cars, the ambulances, the fire trucks, and the dump trucks. Okay, everything else is leased. Okay, so when it's owned, it goes through a bid process. So they, that that upfitter had to bid to win the city contract. Got it. And so at that time, it was just one, um, one, one upfitter uh, vendor that I was dealing with. Okay. And that's the one that's been around for over 100 years. Got it. <laughs> but how, how many people are bidding it, it, or are going, trying to go through that process to win that contract? Mo the thing about it, it, it all comes back down to money. Okay. In dealing with any municipality or any government agency, you have to be willing to not get paid for a very long time, but still do the work. Mm. And Ex so, expound on that. So, how does that work? You, so, right now with the state of Illinois, it takes them 45 days to pay me after we've completed a job. And so, you, when you're bidding for these uh, government contracts, you have to have enough cushion to where you won't go bankrupt trying to fulfill the contract. So, I'm spending out all this money on equipment. However, you're not paying me in a time frame where I can pay, keep the lights on, pay employees, play so employees. So, on, right? so it messes up cash flow because so much money is going out, but now I have to wait days. 
And it's just not with that with larger companies as well. Um, I work with one vendor, well, one company who is a fleet company. And in order to get paid within less than 60 days from them, I had to agree to take a, a, a 2% cut uh, of the invoice uh, in order to get paid within 15 days. Wow. So it's either I'm going to have to wait 60 wait days. 60 or 15 at a lower. At a lower price. Price. Mm -hmm. Okay. So then that was wrapping my mind around that. Like, okay, how do I recruit this 2% I'm losing? Yeah. <laughs> like, at, 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 so at, Okay. So how long was it before? Until you started thinking to yourself, you know what, I, I could do this for myself. Like after you started doing it for the city. Yeah, yeah. So um, like a, a, a year and a half into that position, I just started playing around with uh, some of the equipment. Uh, dealing with partitions and ladder and uh, shelving and lighting and, and just actually learning like how they work. Physically like learning to like, how, how, what they are, touching them, feeling yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, right. and uh, my nails are always my nails. <laughs> so right. um, it, uh, it, it really shocked a lot of the guys in the shops because we worked above one of the shops that I would like come down there and just observe or, you know, ask questions, pick brains. Right. Um, and that wasn't really in the scope of your job, right? Mm -hmm. like just you go down on my lunch break. Do yeah. That. Okay. Like, so what are you guys doing here? And and mind you, we they don't the city doesn't upfit their own vehicles. But if something like ticky tacky happens, like something that's minimal that could be repaired by one of the repair shops, then we'll just send it to a repair shop. GTT Commercial Tires is a tire store that's designed with the owner operator in mind. It serves as a helpful community where you are always their number one priority. Whether you're a new owner operator or you've been driving for years, their mission is the same, to keep owner operators in business. That's why they go above and beyond providing superior customer service when you actually need it, educating you on proper tire care and delivering a no BS sales experience. With two conveniently located stores in Richmond and Petersburg, Virginia, and almost 2,000 five-star Google reviews, they are truly raising the bar and setting a new standard in tire care. Make sure you call 1-800-991-6251 to schedule your appointment now and tell them Truck & Hustle sent you. Okay. And so now it's like, oh, so what, what is this item called and what is that item called? And uh, next thing you know, you know, I have an impact drill in my hand. <laughs> and now I'm, I'm, I'm drilling holes and, and, and putting nuts and bolts together. And, you know, and it turns, into a, it turns into a work of art when you're done. It's like, this is so much fun. Yeah, yeah. And so, uh, so that was 2018. By the time I, like, started dealing with the equipment hands-on as opposed to just ordering it. Right. And so uh, and you, you also have access, obviously, to like the invoices. You see how much things cost in bulk and oh, yeah. you, you oh, understand yeah. the margins and you really get an idea how the business you're works. You're like, right? I'm like, what am I doing still working <laughs> here? Right, like, right. But not realizing at the time the uphill battle that uh, that I would incur from leaving my nice, cushy pension job um to becoming an entrepreneur yeah uh and um you know and all the the loneliness and the empty bank accounts that you incur right once you become an entrepreneur because um with our company i can't do it from home we have to have a workspace right in order to be licensed right it's nothing that i can uh do from just from my com Computer. I actually have to be here. We actually have to have space in order to do it. And so now it's time to take on overhead. Yeah. And uh, not realizing um, how just uh, just overhead alone can bankrupt you. Right. Like just the simple things like. I'm paying too much for rent because I'm not making this much money. Yeah. But I didn't, I've signed a five-year lease. <laughs> so what do I do? Uh, not realizing, because, you know, when we, when we opened up, I had a few customers. Um, so the book of business was starting to grow, but it wasn't strong enough to withhold, with, uh, with, to sustain a global health pandemic. <laughs> got you so once we got brick and mortar well, well, well one sec before we get there real quick talk tell me about the day that you decided to quit 
your job <laughs> and actually transition. What was your mindset? Talk about the emotions that went into that and how did you make that decision? Who did you talk to? Like when you said, you know what, I'm done. Okay. And you and you transitioned and started your own, yeah, started Mercy. So um, since I had access to the vendors, I reached out to one of the owners of the upfitting company that we were working with and uh, asked him if he wanted to uh, have lunch because I wanted to pick his brain. Um, and he was like, sure. And so we sat down for lunch and I was like, I really want to get into vehicle upfitting. And he was like, is this something that you really want to do? I'm like, yes. He's like, we need, we need you. Mm. He's like, the, the outside of Mercer Upfitters, there are no other uh, African-American owned Upfitters in the United States. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Certified. <laughs> That's crazy. That, 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 is, that, is, that are certified Upfitters in the United States. So they were, his company was struggling with a diversity issue as well because they were losing out of contractors because they couldn't find a certified minority partner to work with. Right, right. So he was like, he's like, you're going to win. Got it. Now, was there any conflict of interest in that conversation, being that that was a, a, a city vendor and you kind of go out on your own, on your own in the private sector? Was there anything that could have been looked at for with your position? Like, hey, you're not supposed to do that. Talk to the vendors. I had no authority to give him a contract. Okay. So my ability to uh, put him in a position to win, I had none. Got it. Um, so uh, now if my boss was to go out to, <laughs> at that time was to go out to eat, yeah, that would have been, been a problem. That would have been a problem. But Got it. I, I had no, uh, uh, no uh, weight. I carried no weight in, my, in that position that I had. Got it. That I could push that vendor forward. Got it. Uh, up the up the chain. And they and they were they're not small fries. They're they're going for the big gusto contract. So any anything that they're getting awarded, they're they they're going through the bidding process through uh, procurement. Okay. And was this like just like a random vendor or somebody you had a really good relationship with like somebody? Yeah, o over the course of meeting them coming through, meeting, talking about designs, how they're going to handle the designs with certain vehicles and things like that. You know, and so just from, excuse me, sitting through meetings with them, it was just like, you know, s s you become familiar with people. Right. And then it becomes a hello, sir, to a, hey, <laughs> hey, Pete, you know. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, you know, and so I tell people all the time, um, because it was frowned upon once I did open up Mercer that I did have a, a mentorship relationship with that, with that owner of that company. Mm. Um, cause he, out of nowhere, poof, a black woman is opening up an upfitting business and she's good friends with the largest upfitter in the United States. Right. Right. So it's right. like, where's the corruption at? Yeah, what, yeah, yeah, exactly. What's happening what's here? So, here? so, you know, it was a whole bunch of propaganda being spewed when we first opened up our doors about us not being a legitimate upfitter, how we're just a shell for this larger company so they can get you know, more government contracts. Got it. Um, and so it started hindering us when we would, when we would go on uh, sales calls and our sales calls are, this is pre COVID we're done in person. And so we would just pop up at a dealership like, Hey, we're Mercer Upfitters, you know, I see that, you know, you have a lot of Ram vans on your lot. You know, can you, we want to show you what we do. Here's some cars for your customers. If ever they need a partition, some van shelving, just give us a call, give you a quote. Right. And they'll be like, oh yeah, you're you're the new girl that works with such and such company. Already, they already know. And I'm like, <laughs> well, I don't work with or for them. Yeah. I'm Mercer, they're them. Right. Um, we're not affiliated in any other way outside of, this man is Matt, has, he, he's fourth generation owner of a company that's been around for over a hundred years. Right. Why wouldn't I pick his brain? Why wouldn't you? Exactly. <laughs> like, why wouldn't I request his mentorship? How have you been able, how have you guys been able to survive for so long? Why, why would I start off with someone that's in the same position as me <laughs> to learn something? The blind leading the blind, <laughs> exactly. right? Exactly. <laughs> Real doubt. You know, and you know, during, during that time when the process of me opening up Mercy, he had retired from uh, the business and passed it on down his son. Okay. And so, um, he was no longer really like 
in the day-to-day aspect of that, but more so just here for me if I needed to, hey, this is what's happening. How do I handle it? Mm-hmm. And he was like, y- you just have to keep getting out there. You know, I'm like, do I send cease and desist letters to these people who are, you know, t- t- spreading, you know, falsities yeah. about who we are and, and, and how it's hindering my ability to get business because the industry thinks that it's just the money, the funds are just being back roaded. And so, you know, he was like, no, you just have to weather the storm. Just keep getting out there. You get one person on your side, do good work for them. And you just keep doing it. You just keep doing it. You just have to stay in front. So it's a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of, uh, come to Jesus moments, especially with the bank account. Right. Like, Oh, business is so slow. It's not picking up these, 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 Folks are really trying to not allow us to breathe in in this industry because we are foreign. We are something that is not of the norm with them. And so they became uncomfortable. Something had to be cooking that was illegal. And so uh, when I decided to uh, uh, leave the city, it was after his company uh, got a contract for $135 million with the city of Chicago mm. to upfit their police cars. And it was just like a hundred and thirty five, five years, $135 million. Wow. <laughs> what am I doing here yeah. still? Yeah. It's so crazy. now here comes the search. So then I, I, uh, I couldn't quit right away cause I didn't have brick and mortar. Right. So here comes the search for brick and mortar. Okay. Mr. Landlord, I see you have a nice space here. Are you willing to lease to us? No. This is with 850 credit score. This is with a good amount of savings, like a a good chunk of like, I can pay the rent here up for a year. Yeah, yeah. And you still won't lease to me. Yeah. Why? So it, it it took months and months and months, and we finally were able to get um, our location here. Okay. But we were uh, in a larger unit. We were in a 6,000 square foot unit back in September 2019. Um, and at that time, as soon as I signed that lease, I submitted my two, two weeks resignation okay. to my boss. Got it. Now, my boss was just the deputy commissioner. His boss is the commissioner. And due to my position his boss had to sign off on my resignation. Okay. So of course I have to have a meeting with the commissioner of fleet and facility management now about, am I sure is that I want to resign? Like if is this the decision that you actually, uh, want to make? Right. They're like, it's no turning back. It's like literally like, once you make this decision, that's it. You're, your job, you're comfortable, right? Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> You're living sure. comfortable, right? Right. I'm like, yeah, I'm living pretty comfortable. I got what I asked for. I got the raise. I got the promotion. Where I'm happy I, to the point where I've been able to save up enough money and establish a good enough credit score to where I look uh, um, good to to lenders. Right. To add more money to this business right. when I need to, since I'm starting it up that it's time for me to go. Yeah, yeah, 100%, 100%. (laughs) It's time for me to go now. Um, And so he just looked at me. He said, I wish you the best. And he signed off on the resignation. Mm. Within uh, one day. uh, So if I quit on, say, June 14th, by June 15th, no more health care. No more anything. So I was scrambling. I was like, I got to get my kids to... The doctor, we gotta get to dentist, we gotta make sure, you know, everything is, I get as much as possible before everything just leaves. Because <laughs> <Right. laughs> exactly. it's gonna leave. I'm let's like, do I it have, all. Let's go yeah, get, let's, get our teeth clean, yeah, let's do it, let's everything, do everything. Everything. <laughs> and so uh, once I left, it was just uh, us in an empty space, empty 6,000 square foot space. Got it. Like, what do we do now? Got Hit the it. ground running. Hit the ground running. Okay. So space is secured. Uh, like you said, empty, 6,000 square foot space, but you don't have any product. No product. Right? No so product. I'm assuming you know where to find product. How do you go about getting that? Talk about that transition. Now, product in this industry, 
it is very hard to buy direct. Um, the manufacturers of these products and their salesmen, I wouldn't say the manufacturers, but their salesmen and the way this industry has been ran for so long um, is that they don't like anything new. And so uh, we were able to become a Cargo Master distributor and Cargo Master sells van equipment, which are ladder racks, uh, partitions, uh, van shelving, uh, which is the base that goes into any work van that you're seeing. So whenever you see an Amazon truck pull up, you'll see, or or UPS truck uh, in the neighborhood, they have that sliding partition door that they go and walk to the back, and they have the parcel uh, shelving that flips up or they're able to put stuff on. So we were able to, uh, I was able to meet the owner of Cargo Master at that time at a uh, trade show. Okay introduce myself, let them know that I was trying to, you know, what I was trying to do with Mercer. He said, just give me a call. Sent out his salespeople. They looked around the space. They said, okay, yeah, this looks good. How much can you agree to buy up front? Right. So I'm like, I'm like, how much do I need to buy? <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So they're you, like, you uh, me. at minimum, it needs to be a $30,000 buy. 30,000, no problem. Here you go. I want this, 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 this. Right. I want this many partitions, this many ladder racks, this, this, this amount of van shelving. Right. So this is all in, I want to say, September, November of 2019. Now, let me ask you real quick. How, how do you know the amount of units of what that you want to purchase? So now, due to COVID, I don't stock much. Okay. Because when COVID hit, that $30,000 was just sitting Got it. in steel, looking at me and me looking at it. <laughs> <laughs> Got it, but prior, in, in a normal market. In a normal market, um, you you should at least have at least 15000 in stock of okay. stuff that could go like this. Okay, and what is the popular stuff that is, gets turned around? Oh, uh, every vehicle, every van is going to get a partition. Okay. Because that's the safety steel that goes behind the driver. So if they're carrying any parcels, this stops anything from flying forward. Uh, and, and hitting them or uh, damaging the windshield. So that's off top. Partition, yep. Partition is off top. Uh, van shelving. If you're part of any trade, electrician, uh, plumber, they all need uh, storage bins and organize, organization bins to put their stuff. And so you're always going to have uh, a, sh a shelf or two inside of a, uh, of a van. Ladder racks... And they're the most expensive. And so there's that's kind of on the higher end of clients. At this time, Mercer was only, we were only dealing with other small uh, companies. So under other small trade companies, we didn't really have any large clients at the large company clients at the time okay. who can afford a $2,000 drop down ladder rack. Got it. Now, you know, our guys, our customers at that time, yeah, we, they could do a partition and a shelf. You know, that's, that's a $1,300 build. And, and, and they're good to go. Um, and so, but you want to have the equipment reachable because shipping of, of, of steel and aluminum is extremely expensive and, and, and it weighs a lot. And so the more it weighs, the more expensive it is. Right. Um, and so you want to have enough in stock to where when that customer does call up and say, hey, can I just bring it in tomorrow? You want to say, yes, you can. <laughs> right. <laughs> you right. don't want to say, well, give me about five to seven business days. I got to get it shipped here. They're it's gone. It's not gonna work, right? You, you lost them. <laughs> They're gone. Uh, so uh, you you always want to have you know the basic in stock. So okay. I I stock partitions. I stock van shelving, ladder racks. Not so much. Uh, if that that person really wants a ladder rack. They they're okay with waiting until it comes in. Right. And so uh, and, and 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 that and that was the hard part about just learning how not to overspend when you're an entrepreneur. Right. Uh, I tell my husband all the time, uh, when we first started, we would be buying like uh, nuts and bolts that came with the equipment, but we'll go buy some extras. And I'm like, no, use whatever comes with the equipment first. Right. Because at the end of the day, when we look at our, our margins for the month or our checks and balances for the month, 
and we see where money went and it's just like why do we even why were we spending money on this stuff and we have it right you know and so and, and it all adds up and so uh that was that was that was a a, a huge um thing that also hurt us during COVID the fact that we still had all this equipment sitting and was was unable to recoup from it and like no money was coming in during that time right but we still had all this equipment and uh and we were just stuck with it felt like yeah and so uh but lucky for us you know we we maintain a positive and relationship with Cargo Master to where when business did pick up back up you know the we got back to flow um I try my best now uh, to diversify. But that's another thing when you in- mentioned about equipment, when I said it's very hard to come across it at a favorable price. So say my discount with Gargo Master is 40% off retail. Um, so therefore, you know, I can mark up 40% because I'm still, co- or come in a little bit under because I'm, when my customer Googles the part number that I'm putting on there, right. I'm still going to come in under than what you can buy for for yourself. Got it. Um, so mark up 25, 30% and I'm making a profit. Right. Uh, now my competitors who've been around for forever, 50 plus years, this one company over a hundred years, this other company, they have access to all the brands. When I knocked on those brands doors, they're like, wait a minute. Who are you? Why are you here? Uh, like, I just want to, I want to become a distributor for you. I want to buy and sell your equipment. Right. Stop sign. No, you don't fit our model. Your business doesn't fit our model. So it went from when, when we first started and I tried to diversify because sometimes it's hard to just buy from one company. And if they're out of stock, then I'm, I'm stuck. For sure. So I can't have all my eggs in one basket. So, okay, let me start buying from other brands. But I want to buy at the price of a distributor. I don't want to buy at the price of just another customer. I want to be a distributor. Right. Um, and so it went from, okay, are you ready to buy 40000 in equipment right now? Yes, I am. Oh, well. How can we push the needle? Yeah, well, <laughs> um, let me get back to you, right? So then finally get back to me. And they're like, oh, no, we're not looking for any new distributors right now. Um, you know, maybe we can link you up with one of our current distributors and you can buy from them. Hmm. <laughs> and that's another person that you got to, because they're buying from them and then you got to buy from them. So they got to make their money too. Facts. Right? Facts. So, so how am I ever going to be competitive in price with my competitors? Yeah. If my competitors are able to buy it for a penny on a dollar and I'm paying $15 for it, my margins are going to be sky high. Right. My pricing is going to be sky high. Right. So who would come buy from me? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. When they can go there and, and get it for 10 cents, but I'm charging 30 bucks. Right. <laughs> Crazy, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and so it at one after another, I'm calling upon lighting companies who make the 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 warning lights, uh, steel companies who make the partitions. One after another, no, 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 no. And I just don't understand why. So got to doing a little bit more digging. One of my biggest competitors at the base that I'm at. He has access to all of it. And these sales guys who represent these companies have all befriended him over the past 30, 40 years that they've all been in the business. And so I start following up with the sales guys and they're like, no, we just have our relationship with them and we like to keep it that way. I'm pretty sure he'll give you a good price if you need to buy anything. You could just go through him. And so my reply is, is I'm not trying to ruin anybody's relationship or business. Right. Trying to give you more business. I'm trying to give, you don't want to, you're saying, who, <laughs> you know, in the, in the world I grew up in, who says no to making more money? Correct. Like positively. Right, right, right. Like I'm not, this is no criminal activity. <laughs> I'm literally trying to be your customer and give you more money and put your product in more vehicles. And you're telling me no due to the relationship you've built with this other company. And since we're in the same exact market, 
you're not willing to sell directly to me. Mm. It's like beef farmers telling Burger King, no, we only sell to McDonald's. <laughs> right. We're not right. selling you any beef. Right. We're only going to sell this beef to McDonald's and good luck. Yeah. Now, if you want to buy some beef, you could go talk to McDonald's. McDonald's. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> and so it, 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 it became extremely frustrating and more so like they are really trying to starve us out because if we don't have equipment, then we can't sell anything. If we can't sell anything, we can't pay the bills. You know, I, I, I tell every time I meet a new uh, potential uh, manufacturer that I would like to work with, I tell them all the time, I'm not trying to ruin um, anybody's business or relationships that you already currently have with them. I'm trying to establish a relationship with you. And I'm trying to keep this business that me and my family are building alive for generations just like they have. What is so wrong with us over here at Mercer wanting to do that? Right, right. <laughs> Why, why is that, why is that cons considered a threat to the economy or the ecosystem that you guys have already built, established, uh, have established yeah. at, and, and, and me just trying to just hop in it. Mm. And so, yeah, that, that, that's one of the biggest hurdles, you know, people say, uh, you know, cash flow is always going to be an issue with any small business, but the biggest hurdle is being able to have access to material and sell it at a favorable rate to where you're, you're, um, you're able to compete. You know, I, I, when people go get new windows or floors, you know, they call around for estimates first. Right. So that's how my customers do it too. Right. 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 <laughs> so they're not, I'm not, they're not just taking the quote I'm giving them and say, yep, that's just how much it's going to cost. We're coming in right away. No, they're going to call around. To other to other to my other competitors and say, hey, can I get a quote on the exact same thing that they just asked me for? And if they come in cheaper, that sale is theirs. Right. But I can come in cheap too if I'm able to access and, and buy the equipment. You know, probably not at the same rate, but at least some type of discount. Right, right, right. At least close. <laughs> right. At least something to work with. Right, something. So. Uh, that that's that's been our biggest hurdle, and it's been frustrating um, to not be able to diversify our inventory properly because everybody doesn't want that brand. Some people really like other brands right. that they want to go with, and it's and it's hard to tell them. Well, I get you this for cheaper as opposed to saying I could get you this because that's what you want. But now I'm, I have to sell them on this other brand that they probably never wanted just because I could get it to them for cheaper. Right. And so sometimes customers aren't willing to make that uh, sacrifice. They like what they like. And if I can't provide them what they like at a reasonable price, then they're just going somewhere else. Gotcha. How many different types of brands are they that make these types <sighs> of products? Uh. <sighs> There are a ton out there, but the major ones you're looking at like a um, three or four major players three in, or four. in the in the upfitting world. You're looking at Cargo Master, you're looking at Weather Guard, um, you have Ranger. Um, those I would say those are the top three. Okay. That when when I get calls for, it's you know. How much is it? Because this is what we want. And, mo and most of them supply pretty much everything within the range of what you, what you need for yep. upfitting. It's just, it's like I said, it's whatever type of cheeseburger you would like. Right. You know, uh, they pretty much make the exact same product. They just style it differently. Got it. Got you it. Know. Now, does any of this stuff, uh, is this any of this stuff made offshore? Like oh, o all oh, overseas, oh, right? Yeah, all overseas. But, well, but uh, you're dealing with the people, the manufacturers here like you're dealing with their operations here, here yeah. but it's made yep yep so uh cargo master comes out of china and when uh when we started to pick up right after like the whole big covid chokehold started loosening up around our necks and business started picking it up we couldn't um their material was just stuck on some ship on in some seat right, 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 right. <laughs> so it was very hard to come by equipment because they couldn't get it over here fast enough um some parts are made in the united states 
but n- not the essential stuff. So just like any company, you're going to go, if you're, if you're producing in bulk, how many can I get for a very low price? So if I'm selling 100 pieces of, say, say I'm selling 1 billion ladder, well, 100 ladder racks, and my United States manufacturer says, well, you're only ordering 100, um, I could give it to you at probably $100 a ladder rack. But then if I go overseas and I say I want to buy 100, and they're like, okay, well, if you buy 200, we can give it to you at maybe $75 a ladder rack. Right. And so it, with the with the popular parts, they're outsourced. Okay. With the parts that aren't uh, selling uh, as uh, fast as some of the popular parts, those are manufactured here, and they usually come with a higher uh, higher price range as well. Got it. So, so you can get parts overseas, but they won't be like the branded parts, right? They'll be like a no frills version, or how does that work? No, no, no. It's still it's still part of their company. Still part of their company. Yep, okay, yep, so yep. they this one company is making it. They they the operations here in the U.S., but they make it actually in overseas. But yep. they're all still affiliated, so they're not necessarily like purchasing from someone else. No, overseas. no, 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 no. It's yeah, their company. This is their company still, and um, I know Weatherguard. Uh, the boxes that I have back there. Uh, they come from Crystal Lake. Okay. But, um, you know, just that one box is a thousand bucks, you know? Right, <laughs> so, right, right. as opposed to if I was to buy from an overseas manufacturer of a box that is comparable, it would probably only cost me 250 bucks. Got it. Got it. Who's your, who's your typical customer and, and how do you find them or how do they find uh, you? My customer base is, uh, the, my best customer base are fleet management companies. Uh, so the enterprises of the world. Okay. The Leash USAs of the world. Those companies who manage for larger companies. And so, uh, you know, when you see a vehicle that has Coca-Cola on it or People's Gas or uh, ComEd, the majority of their vehicles are leased. And so these companies, they're going... They have their fleet manager at, say, at ComEd contact a fleet manager at Enterprise and say, hey, I need 600 vehicles, and I want them all this. And, and then Enterprise gets on the dial, and they call out to dealerships. So after the fleet, so those will be the money customers, okay. the fleet companies. Um, the keep the lights on customers are the dealerships. Okay. Because they're constantly dealing with, uh, you know, small trades companies. They're also dealing with the larger companies. So those fleet managers that work at these dealerships who, in their, in their, in their commercial fleet department, you know, they're selling high volume of work vehicles and trucks. All right, guys, listen, before we continue the show, I got to give a shout out to our sponsor and our partner, OTR Solutions, formerly OTR Capital. But listen guys, OTR is much, much more than just a factoring company. They provide so many solutions to help the small carrier not only get into business, but to stay in business and maintain, right? So you guys have to partner with them and check them out. Don't take my advice for it. Talk to their clients, right? Talk to their clients. Find out what the people are saying. Everybody will tell you the same thing. So make sure you give OTR Solutions a call at 470-900-3338 or click the link in the bio below. Make sure you check them out and tell them Truck and Hustle sent you. And so you want to get on their radar just to say if they have a customer come in and buy a van one day, uh, they can pass on my card or my booklet and say, hey, call them. They, they do some upfitting. You can get a quote for them. And so then that's when our, uh, I call them our onesie twosie customers. You know? Okay. It's one guy starting a business price, you know, he has one truck and he wants to, you know, get it to look like a work truck. I probably won't see him again for another 10 years until, you know, he's exhausted that work truck. Right. Um, but he knows to keep coming back and that dealer and I have established relationship to where his customer was happy with what we, we did. And that customer will most likely go back to him to buy his next truck. Mm. But then when it comes to the fleet world, we're talking massive amounts of vehicles are being bought. And they're still going through those commercial fleet departments at the dealerships to buy them. 
And so um, the municipalities and the larger, the, the Fortune 500 companies aren't buying directly from a dealership. They're going to put in a fleet manager uh, management company to do that. They don't ever want to. They don't want to touch that. They don't want to deal with it. Right. Um, and so they're going to go with who the companies who uh, specialize in, in managing large volume uh, purchases when it comes to vehicles because it could be very tedious. And so, like, uh, say, say right now, the city of Chicago um, buys, leases their vehicles through Enterprise right now. So Enterprise bid it for the city of Chicago's uh, contract, won the contract, has it for five years. Um, and so when we do vehicles for the city of Chicago, I don't speak ever to anybody that works for the city of Chicago. Right. I speak only to the enterprise rep that's handling their account. Okay. And so, uh, and that's who pays me. The city doesn't pay because they pay enterprise to handle this. And then enterprise charges the city. Mm. And so, um, and, and, and that was, this was put in place to give the city employees autonomy, uh, from any, you know, um, favoritism complaints or anything like that, where you can say this city employee that works in this department is favoring this one company and they're sending work their way all the time. No enterprise has the bid. They were awarded through procurement. Now they get to pick and choose who the upfitter is. Right. So now I'm at enterprise's door. <laughs> hey, I'm Rachel Mercer Coleman with Mercer upfitters, you know, Need anything upfitted for any of your customers? <laughs> right, 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 right. You know, and but and, and it's a lot of gatekeepers. It's a lot of gatekeepers, and uh, and people. What I what I realize is people become compliant with working with who they have worked with for so long that they stop seeking um, um, new vendors. Right. And so um, another thing that happened over COVID. Um, so I had been knocking on Enterprise Door for like two years. Hey, hey, we're here, we're here, we're here. You know, my competitors are telling you, you gotta wait six months to get some vehicles through there. I could take them now. Right. You know, we get them out for you now. And so just dealing with salespeople, emailing, nobody returning emails, nobody returning voicemails, nobody, uh, you know, looking at the brochure, giving me a call and saying, hey, got your brochure in the mail, saw the pricing, let's go for it. In July of 20. 20, the mayor of Chicago put an executive order in that any business that currently held a city of Chicago contract had to be compliant with having partnered with a minority owned uh, business. Mm. Now you'll say minority owned business. You're just thinking, Oh, just, you know, a minority owned business, but you have to be certified minority owned. Got it. In, in business. I'm pretty sure that, you know, you don't get recognized as a minority owned business until you are certified. Right. Just because you was born a minority, <laughs> yeah, no, right? <laughs> don't work like no, that. No, it don't work like that. <laughs> you know, that, uh, and so, uh, so that forced a lot of people's hands. And next thing you know, I start getting calls. Uh. We're certified, we're qualified, and you can no longer ignore us. There you go. And so, you know, business just started picking up and it's been uphill ever since. I, I, you know, I don't, I'm not quite sure how COVID did a lot of people, but it, it, it humbled us and it became a blessing uh, all at the same time. Like we literally went broke and back up and running yeah, <laughs> just yeah, like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so uh, um, that, that's where we are now with, you know, if, and, and, and now even with the state of Illinois, they have a business enterprise program that they've established as well to if you're a certified minority owned company in the state they are now you just register with them they are now linking you with their their vendors that hold contracts to say this company is in alignment with what you do for us right now so why haven't you partnered with them right because all of these contracts have that spend already written in the contract to where it says um you know when you partner with a minority owned con tractor, you know, out of, say, with, say, go back to the police contract, $135 million. The spend for minority participation was 10%. However, I didn't, I wasn't certified at the time that contract was issued out. Right. And so they were able to just waive it. 
And so all that money still just went to the 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 vendor that won the bid as opposed to cuz they were able to show proof that there was no qualified certified minority owned company in in uh the state of Illinois that can would be able to fulfill uh that need. Mm. And so uh but now even with those contracts being issued, once you register with these uh government agencies and you, you are certified and you are recognized, they are now willing to link you with already established prime contract holders. Okay. To say, hey, <laughs> this this company fulfills the need that we're asking you to find. Right. Why haven't you reached out yet? Right, 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 right. <laughs> like, what's, what's going what's on going here? What's going on, yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> taxpayers have already paid for this part of this this contract to be paid to underserved, disadvantaged businesses. And so we're not going to continue to honor our contract with you if you're not honoring the contract. And so now they have to just show proof and, 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 and partner. It's, it's, and it was, and this is something that I did not realize before going into business at the, how hard it was to, uh, say, Hey, you know, we, we are capable and we are here to do the exact same work that you do, but not get recognized for it. Right. Just to be like, good luck, you know, but not, and no one forcing it. And so what COVID did, it, it, it made all of those uh, government entities and larger entities do an audit. They did an audit and said, What's going on? We don't have any minority partners. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and now, you know, and, and, and it was such a big push and it still is. And, and, and that's the thing about getting uh, black owned businesses uh, 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 marketed and, and name out there, which was non existent before right. COVID. Right. And so now we're in the midst of, you know, trying to recover from COVID and, and everybody is popping up with support small black businesses, support small black businesses. And so, the government and and their many different departments had to realize like we really don't support <laughs> small black businesses so let's audit and and that's what occurred they start auditing their own books and realizing that they had zero minority participation across the board when it came to vehicle upfitting and here you have a certified company right here that nobody is utilizing yeah. and you're allowing your contract holders to ignore without any checks and balances. Right. And so now everybody's on a checks and balance system no doubt. when it comes to, uh, uh, if you, if you hold any of those type of contracts. Mm. Um, and so it's, it's just been uphill and, uh, we've been truly blessed and grateful that, uh, it, 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 it has been beneficial for us. Um, because like I said, we actually know what we're doing here. Right. <laughs> so right. it wasn't like, oh my God, don't send us any customers. We really don't know anything. No, right. send them all right, right. now. <laughs> that, that's, that's, that's actually a good point. So when the floodgates kind of opened up, I mean, how did you guys handle that? Because you went from kind of zero to hero, right? Like right. you had to order a lot of parts. Like how, how'd you maintain to be able to fulfill all those? Now here we are back to cash flow. <laughs> we had went so long without making any money. Right. So now it's like, okay, uh, let me knock on this bank's door uh, and, and see how far we could get. Of course, we didn't make a huge profit in 2019 because that's when we just opened. And so when I'm providing tax paperwork to lenders, they're like, and you want how much? <laughs> <laughs> right, 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 right. You're right. like, mm -hmm. I don't know about that. So, you know, had to come back to some of my customers, especially the larger ones who want to, who take, uh, you know, month, month and a half, two months to pay that we are unable to uh, honor those terms. You know, we would have to get paid, you know, net seven, net 10, net 15. I can't go past that. Right. Um, and so with, with, with the vendors that I was still, in, that I was still in good standing with, uh, you know, I was still on a net 30 with them. So ordering equipment and then paying them back in 30 days, it, it kind of balanced out our cash flow issue. And then, especially with the customers paying quicklier, uh, faster now. Right. Um, and uh, it, it, it just, it just, it just meshed. It just meshed until you run into like 
working for state governments. It's just a whole nother. <laughs> whole nother monster. Ooh. <laughs> did, did, did any of those other uh, vendors ever have a change of heart, like start opening up the doors, like to where they do business with, you know, my, minority owned businesses, these people that these kind of gatekeepers that are kind of keeping you out? Or is that still, oh, still a no. kind of a same issue? It's still a no. They'll link me with uh, a distributor that they already had in their network that's close to me. And but, the, I, you know, it's a little bit more now I see it for what it is. Right. You know, one part I get it. You're trying to protect the current distributors that you currently have. So you're trying to generate them some revenue and send business their way. However, um, why wouldn't you want to make more money for your company? Right. You know, if I buy directly through you. And so now what has occurred is uh, some vendors are now still directing me to their distributors, but I'm still getting like the same discount. Okay. <laughs> okay. Magically. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still getting that forty percent off of retail. Right. But I'm but I'm not able to buy directly from the manufacturer. Okay. I have to go through their distributor. They've, they've compromised. Right. Because I'm like I'm like I'm like because anytime I I meet with a a, a, a vendor of a, a, a of a, or a manufacturer of whatever light steel aluminum, I tell them to come on over. Yeah. My lot's full. Right. <laughs> my, my lot's full and I'm trying to give you some money right, right, right. <laughs> come check us out we're working we're right. working <laughs> yeah exactly and so you know even after the nose just start rethinking and, I, and I'll get an email saying hey I want to link you with such and such company out in whatever town in Illinois they're one of our distributors you can uh, we're going to set you up in the system but you'll be buying through him gotcha but it'll still be at the forty percent discounted rate. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, you're every. I, why wouldn't you want to accept my money? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why wouldn't you want to accept it? So I guess it's a it's a win win for everybody. You know that their current distributor still gets to make a profit, but he, like I said, he still. If I'm getting forty percent off. Imagine. There you go. <laughs> exactly. exactly. Imagine what his discount is it's that he's able level. to still sell it to me right, at right. such a low rate. Still. Right. Um. And um, and but the drawback is, is when you go to these manufacturers website and they say, get a quote or find a distributor near you. You know, my name won't pop up, but theirs will. Right. <laughs> right. And, right. And, th and that and that hinders my marketing ability, you know, um, to say I am out here, too. But since I'm not a distributor for this brand, even though I'm buying it and selling it and installing it, I'm not recognized by them. Right. Got it. And so it, 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 that becomes extremely frustrating as well. So what I did is I just started putting uh, their logos on my website. Here is who I sell. Mm, <laughs> y'all going to know. Yeah, you <laughs> well, one way or another, <laughs> y'all going to know. Here is who I sell. We sell all of it. You know, um, call us. We, we can get whatever you need. Right. And so uh, that, 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 that was something that, you know, just a lot of thinking. I think as an entrepreneur... Um, you, you have to constantly stay on your toes. Um, you have to constantly be thinking about how do I stay relevant? How do I not become complacent? And, you know, people calling me now as opposed to me calling people for right. business. Right. You know, you know, how do I not um, get lost in success and saying, well, I'm comfortable, um, you know, eating, um, you know, ground beef. I'm comfortable in eating ground beef. I enjoy it. But I really do like an aged sirloin. <laughs> right. Every now and again. Yeah. <laughs> so how do I get to a point where, you know, I can go buy that that 50 ounce sirloin right. that I really do enjoy. Right. You know, but I can survive no off of, of my ground beef just no fine. Doubt. But no doubt. you know, so it's it's all about, you know, constantly being innovative, constantly thinking outside the box and, and constantly trying to make yourself relevant. Like I said, I'm in an industry that doesn't market. You won't see a commercial, you won't see a billboard, you won't hear any, any radio, anything about the upfitting world. And most of the people that, that are my local competitors, you know, the people that run them are of a certain age group, which is around my grandparents' age. Right. Um, and so, They've been successful without social media. <laughs> right, for sure. 
I'm going to utilize social media as much as possible. You're going to see these transformations. You're going to see exactly what our work looks like. Um, and hopefully it generates more and more revenue. I did the, the Mellow route where I sent out a, a mail blast and every single one of uh, just mailed out a, a, like a brochure and flyer to every single last one of my customers. Nobody reads those. Right. Mailing out magnets and it just became like none of it is generating any revenue. Right. I've, I've spent all this money on this market material, but it's not generating anything. What, how can I reach these people? So start doing email blasts, um, start uh, tagging them in my Instagram post. Hey, look at what we just did. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. give me a call. Right, right, <laughs> You're going right. to, I tagged you now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's <laughs> I know you see it. <laughs> I know you see it, right? Exactly. So, see you in my stories. Yeah. <laughs> you're checking me out, but I, you're not, you're not hitting me up. You're not calling What's going me. on? Yeah. So it, 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 in this industry, since we are the new kids on the block and we do not look like everybody else, um, we have to work extremely hard to survive that uphill battle and extremely uh, patient and constantly trying to educate more or tr con trying to get people to get to know us more yeah. as opposed to the, the book and its cover. Yeah. And so uh, th 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 that's, that, that's, the biggest hurdle in this industry is, um, unfortunately, the way I look is not what an upfitter looks like. The way I dress is not what an upfitter looks like. Um, how I do my hair is not what upfitters look like. And so it's such a foreign concept to them that we can even be legitimate with me at the helm. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, so, uh, and so I just tell them, you know, just. Stop on by. I'm here every day. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes Not you might see my kids. Me. You came in, you saw my puppy. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. uh, we're here every day. No uh, so you, you don't even have, need an, uh, when it's on that side of business, you don't even need an appointment. Just pop on in. Yeah. Uh, but, um, but we, in order to reduce like just random traffic, we did at one point we were like, we're no appointment needed. Come in. But now it is appointment necessary because people come in say they want something we'll spend all time getting it together for them and then they're like oh no this price is too much Got we're it. gonna head on out so call me email me first i'll send you over a quote if you're okay with that number then come on in <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah typical vehicle that comes through here like you said with the enterprise fleet manager managers that you work with what's the transformation that you guys are making to the vehicle just to kind of give the audience an understanding of what that vehicle starts out looking like and what it ends up looking like okay so like these two um this is actually for chicago transit authority so cta this is one of their pickup trucks that came in from enterprise once it's done, it's going to have lighting on the front bumpers. It's going to have a toolbox in the back. It's going to have a window gate to protect the back window from uh, getting busted. Um, it's going to have backup alarm on it. Um, and we send it out the door. This vehicle is for Canteen, the um, catering uh, cafeteria company. They have a whole bunch of companies up on their cat canteen. Okay. Um, they just come as shells. So it's just the two seats and that's it when it comes to us. So we put a floor in, um, we put a partition in, we're putting in backup alarms. The whole vehicle will be decaled when it leaves here as well. Um, so not a complete wrap, but a partial wrap. Okay. Um, and we send it on its way. Okay. It's a few of them that we just finished decaling today that are in the lot. And they have all the partitions and the E-track and the ratchet straps that go along with the E-track inside. And so you could look at this one. This is the beginning. And then you go out there and look at those. And that's the end. Uh, I post all of our work on uh, Ed Mercer Upfitters at Facebook or Instagram. Okay. <laughs> if you guys are ever interested. <laughs> no doubt. Definitely, definitely <laughs> check it out. And so well, it's a lot of before and after videos on there. What's the typical cost to do something like that? Oh, uh, it gets expensive. It okay. gets expensive. So this is just a base uh, 
build right here behind you with this Ram vehicle with the partition, the floor, the E-Track, and the backup alarm, you're looking at 4,600 bucks. With just the lighting um, for this pickup truck, you're looking at 1,500 bucks, just lighting. Gotcha. Now, once they start adding other aftermarket parts, like the toolboxes and the uh, window gate, you know, that bumps it up another $1,000. And so, uh, but the typical base bill, which is this one is pretty much typical, about 3,500 bucks. Got it. What type of margins do you guys see? Oh my goodness. Uh, my margins are very favorable. <laughs> Cause the, the reality is, is um, it's all about being able to buy the equipment and outside of retail price. And so anything that I put on these vehicles, most likely the normal part, the, uh, Joe Blow can go online and order it itself. The problem is he doesn't know how to install it. Right, right, right. <laughs> and so most likely he's going to come back to me say, it just won't go in right. Right. And so we're like, because you didn't do this right. And that's why go. we exist. Yeah. Um, but um, my, I, I see 10% margins on everything uh, that I do. I have to keep it that way just to keep overhead. For sure. And everybody paid. No doubt. And so, uh, and that's at the lower end. Um, when it comes to like ladder racks, I could get them for a good price, but retail, a, a, a ladder rack, a double drop down ladder rack, which is ladder rack that uh, you're able to put ladders on and you're able to uh, drop them down on each side of the vehicle. It's almost $3,000 retail. Mm. And so, of course, if my customer wants to check my numbers, I'm only selling it for 2200 you can go online and buy it all you want for three thousand. <laughs> we come to me, right. Right. <laughs> and I can give it to you at a favorable rate for sure. But you know, sticker shock is always something when it comes to the the smaller customers, the smaller um, um, purchasing base customers. When it comes to the enterprises of the world, they're not really worried, but they understand what it takes to get the job done. Yep, I uh, this one, this vehicle is managed by Enterprise Fleet, and this is managed by Holman Fleet. Now, Holman also is an upfitter as well, um, but they are such a large upfitter um, that they realize that they can have their own fleet company, own insurance company, and own their own dealerships. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> but they're so large that sometimes some of their customers have um, just a handful of vehicles that need to get upfitted, and, and it just doesn't match into their uh, their build process, they're they're an assembly line. You know, you have to be coming with them with a hundred plus vehicles before they're like, we're not going to make you wait. Right. You come with them with six vehicles, they're gonna like, uh, we're outsource it. Here, go over there. Now with Holman, since they are already in the upfitting business, when I send them a quote, they know that the prices are where they need to be. Right. Cause this is what they do as well. Right, 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 <laughs> so, right. um, and it, and it works out cause it's not, it's no back and forth. It's no haggling. It's no, uh, well, you know, <laughs> what I always think about the Chris Rock skit from uh Saturday, not Saturday Night Let Live. Let me get one chicken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, get no, you off of, uh, in living color, in living yeah, color, yeah, in living yeah, color. Yeah, yeah. Uh, how much? How much is that? Well, that's ten dollars. Uh, how about you just <laughs> let me lick it? And, <laughs> and we, how would you be? No, right. so I don't have to deal with any of that when it comes to the larger companies because they are familiar with the industry and how expensive everything is. Right. Um, inflation has been a killer this year. Uh, you know, the same ladder rack that I could have bought a year ago for twelve hundred bucks, now it's costing me. Uh, eight, it's eight hundred dollars more. So now I'm almost at two thousand dollars for the exact same part. Wow. Um, and it it the lighting lighting that I could have bought for forty bucks is now uh, costing me uh, sixty five bucks. You know it it and of course I have to increase my pricing. Right. Because I'm like I'm no longer seeing a profit really with these. Um, and so inflation has been definitely terrible, I think, on all small businesses just to just try to afford what we used to could afford. But now, you know, it, it has gotten so expensive. So hopefully 
things change. But something will give. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but your your business is more so lean towards enterprise accounts, right? Than than like yeah, the, we lean towards more towards fleet management fleet companies. management companies. Yep. So we though we're knocking on all their doors, and you know you don't you don't really realize how you, you it, just by being like a just a car renter. You just think Hertz Enterprise, Dollar, Ace, they're just all into just renting cars. Right. So like, just here, here's a car, one car there, one car there. No, they are managing pretty much the world's vehicles right now that are on the road. Wow. Any large company, AT&T, T-Mobile, uh, any large brand is being managed by a fleet company. Wow. And so... Uh, we just did 90 vehicles for Leash USA, and their customer is Sunrun, which is the electrical panel company that just was awarded this huge contract uh, with the United States of America to um, turn people's homes into uh, electrical solar powered homes for gas and electrical. And so they get their money off of going to people's homes and putting up solar panels and bam, now we're reducing the, car, reducing the carbon footprint. Yeah. And so they ordered 90 vehicles just from this one dealership here in Illinois. And uh, we, we were able to win that contract. And so 90 trucks that came in looking like this, but they left blue. Mm. Uh, and um, we wrapped them with all the Sunrun decals. It was complete wrap. Um, and ladder rack, not a, yeah, ladder rack we put on there and a toolbox. And so that's just that one leasing company. Right. That has this large client. And so then you start talking more. Who else is your clients that you guys are managing? Right, right, right. And you're like, oh, you have sailor too. <laughs> <laughs> what do they need? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you, you start looking around at, you know, all these cars and vans on the road. And you're like, every single one of them has an aftermarket part on it. Like, it's not a day you're going to drive down the street and don't see a vehicle with some aftermarket parts on it. Impossible. Yeah. And, and it's such a, and it's, and it's crazy that no one ever questions where do you even get this stuff from? Who's right. doing it? Right. You know, we, I, I look at, I tell people sometimes, I, we're the, the cardboard roll at the end of your toilet paper. <laughs> Nobody right. ever thinks about where Where does that role come where from? Where does that role come right. from? You just discard it. No one thinks about the role. Where does that role come from? Yeah. Like, who makes that role right. that goes in the whole toilet paper together? <laughs> you know? Right. Who puts that ladder rack? Who puts those lights on that car? Yeah. You know, um, it's us. And so, um, and, and it's money in it, just like that toilet roll. The, 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 whoever makes that 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 roll, who I have to find out who. Yeah. And, and I'm pretty sure they're they're billionaires. Right. <laughs> Generation, like you saw, probably generations of the same person making a roll. Just making a roll all day. <laughs> you know what I mean? And, and then you go even deeper. The machine that spins it. That's another generational wealth, and the parts that go in that machine, and so forth and so but on. But nobody's right? knocking Nobody on that door to, about that. to even look to see, hey, right, who does this, right? And how do I get into it? Yeah, it's like a. Uh, I was talking to someone the other day about uh, uh, shopping cart wheels. One company makes them for the entire United States. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> One, That's the wheels on shopping carts. That's a, even if you think of like elevators, <laughs> like the like elevators in hotels, yeah, and hotels, it's, it's like Otis. That's it. <laughs> They have a monopoly on every. I think there's maybe one or like two other companies we, that do it. We've done a couple of their vehicles, but they do everything, they do and they have all. a monopoly on all elevators. And there's elevators everywhere. everywhere. But nobody's like, how, how can we disrupt this? How can we make elevators too? Yep. Yep. It. it it's amazing how we, as a, as a community, as a culture, we have not been given the wherewithal to, I guess, dig into industries. Right. It's what we, what's on the surface. We know these certain industries exist. And so we just fall in line with finding jobs there as opposed to saying, what else is out there 
that is lacking diversity, that is lacking our involvement. Um, you know, we, I'm in the process of trying to start a training workforce program with city, city colleges of Chicago. Um, to, cause they have, um, they have the automotive program. They have, um, uh, an aviation program. Uh, they have, a um, like a steel, I, I, but it's something about with steel, like working it, bending it like a pipe bender and things of that nature. But these are all programs that I can benefit from any person that's going through their, that program to come and be an upfitter. Right. They all know their hands, they, they, they're way around a tool. Uh, they understand the concept of building. And I can train anybody on how to do this. Um, and so it's like those, those kids that come through those programs, they finish those programs, get their certifications. And now what, where do I get a job at? You know, some of these places when it comes to aviation, um, cause they, they're, um, they're aviation mechanics, but most people stay at those jobs for forever. And so it's not a lot of turnover or retention. Right. And so, yeah, you have this certification as to be in a mechanic, but who's about to hire you right now? There's an aviation school literally right on the corner, right here on 38th. It just opened up. Um, and literally, we walk in there, they have, like, dissected airplanes. <laughs> it's just parts everywhere. Right. Where they're teaching these kids, um, you know, how to fix airplanes and build them. But the reality of it is, is after they leave there, how fast can they get a job? Here I am saying, you know the difference between an impact wrench and an impact drill? Come see me. <laughs> right, right, right. Come and see me. We can we can we can get you get you on a vehicle immediately. And uh so trying to establish that with city colleges. So um because they have the bodies. Um and unfortunately, a lot of people aren't hiring. A lot of people probably wouldn't hire from those specific programs. And so but the people still need work. Facts. And so, you know, just, but of course, once again, working with anything that's managed by the government is kind of a lot of paperwork, bureaucracy, talk to this person, talk to that person, talk to this person. Yeah. So it's like, eventually, how do I, how do we establish this? And so now it's just more so um, passing the paperwork around to get approved. And hopefully by the beginning of next year, we'll have these kids rolling in uh, 90 days of training. Uh, trying to set it up to where um, 90 days of training, um, city colleges pays for the, the for those 90 days. Yeah. After those 90 days, if I want to keep them on, then now they're now they're my employee. Dope. And so it's more so like a paid internship. Yeah. But, and and they have the funding. It's just more so how to make it um, get it approved. Yeah. How to get it approved, basically. So that's what we're working on now. Got it. How many staff do you guys have now? Four. Four. It's four of us and uh, uh, working, working, working all the time. Um, around the clock. Around the clock. You <laughs> met my husband earlier. He's the director of operations, so this is his baby. Got it. The garage is his. And so um, um, we sit down, we discuss what we have coming up daily, what's on the board, how what's priority, what needs to get out faster, uh, what inventory I don't even let them worry about inventory. I still do inventory because <laughs> I'm the one that's still ordering it and right. uh, making sure the numbers make sense when we're ordering it. So um, let him have, have, we have a billion dollars worth of inventory here. <laughs> and we'll be like, but when are we going to sell it? When are we going to sell it? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. So um, he handles the garage and the guys more so. Um, and I'm, I'm everything else. Got it. And so if you're looking for a sales team, here I am. <laughs> you're looking for HR, here I am. That's right. That's right. That's right. You're looking for marketing team, yeah. <laughs> that's me. Yeah. And so, uh, but my my husband with, with, with his techs, they're a strong little team. Yeah. And they knock it out. They it. knock it out and we're working and we're working. You know, I had a couple vendors come visit me one day that uh, they just popped up that I was trying to establish a, a distributor relationship with. They came in and they didn't see anybody. They're like, well, but where is everybody at? I'm like, well, some of my guys have other jobs and they can't come in until after five o'clock. 
And so we alternate days. If you come in before five, you're here. If not, see you at five. Right. Uh, husband, you're working late tonight with the guys at five. Right. Cool. Right. You know, so we, we switch it up and we make it work. The job still gets done. The job still gets done and we're able to uh, uh, be very successful in, in making sure uh, that the job gets done and it gets done right. That's we right. have we we our uh, vehicles go through a three stage quality control process, and so it starts off with the installer. Once he installs, he has a, a installation sheet that he has to sign off on, and it has to get returned uh, to um, Ronnie, who is operations director of operations, which is my husband. Then he goes behind the installer, literally pulls on every single piece that has been installed right if there's any loose piece if, if there's any jiggle wiggle anything because like i said we're installing things on top of vehicles i can the i can i can't even imagine if a ladder rack we install one day falls off someone's car while right. they're going 60 miles an hour on the expressway right um and so now i know who installed it the director of ops he's now going to do his quality control he's going to sign off on it then it hits my desk for release. Got it. And so it nothing leaves the shop without three people touching and pulling and viewing the vehicle before it drives away. And so uh, it in, in in that process, there is no lacking in that process. Yeah. Uh, and and it has and it has stayed strong because that that's the type of shop we run. You're, there are no corners being cut here. We're, our name is on it. That's right. And so once it leaves here, uh, it represents us. And um, I, we've worked too hard for anybody to say, that installation is trash. Yeah. And bring it back. No, yeah. that's never going to happen. There you go. And so uh, we take pride in it. Yeah. No doubt. No doubt. Well, man, amazing story and amazing business. I've, I've, I've learned so much. And like you said, man, this whole world of upfitting. It's, it's not even a world that I, I've been in transportation for years and I don't even really know anything about it. Like it's one of those things where I've heard about it, but you know, you don't really know. So it's just really cool to just learn about this. And thank you for just being so transparent with uh, the business and kind of educating people on it. I'm here to help. Yeah. I'm here yeah. to learn. I, every, every, every time I do a talk or, um, anytime I, uh, send out like notification about how to get more minorities involved in this, in this in this industry you know it is to make people aware that it exists and you can make a lot of money in it. <laughs> right and it and 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 and, and, and it's, it is not rocket science right it's not right. <laughs> so it, it's something that could definitely be beneficial across the board and it's not anything that would take long to catch on to once you're in it you're in it um, and I'm just trying to just trying to open the world's eyes to this to this industry because my competitors would like to keep it a secret. Right. Because the more if it's only three, four of them, they can get all the business. Right. That's right. If nobody else exists. And so now, you know, it's just time for a change. There you go. Now it's I love time it. For a change. I love it. All right. So customarily on the show, we always have two things at the end. We have to obviously know, let people know where they can connect with you okay. and learn more about you personally, social media, all that stuff. And then we always end with the final thought, which is something entrepreneurial, spiritual, wherever you want to take it. A few, you know, jewels to leave the audience with. Right. So let's start with where people can connect with you and learn more about Mercer Upfitters. And then we'll go into that final thought. All righty. Um, we are on all your social media platforms at uh, Mercer Upfitters. Uh, and we're located right here on the south side of Chicago, 1430 West 38th Street, uh, 60609. Uh, I can also be reached by email at rachel.mercer at mercerupfitters.com or by phone at 773-425-3931. Uh, just give us a call, shoot us an email, like a post, DM us. I answered those two. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. So, uh, um, uh, and, and, and we're here to, we're here to uh, get your, your work vehicle working for you. And so. There it is. And then final thought. Final thought. Um, entrepreneurship is uh, 
something that you have to enter in wanting to succeed. Uh, nothing will ever be handed to you as an entrepreneur. Um, and um, you always have to have the drive to continue to be better at your craft as an entrepreneur. Uh, you can never become complacent as an entrepreneur because you'll get left behind um, and, 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 and forgotten about. Um, so um, one thing, I, uh, what you have to have as an entrepreneur is uh, mental toughness and, uh, and dedication. So no cutting corners with that. Mm. Mental toughness and dedication. If you want it, you gotta, gotta, you gotta keep pushing. You gotta keep pushing. No doubt. If you can't respect that, your whole perspective is whack. Hustle fam, you know what we do around this time. If you smell something burning, it's only a desire. This has been an amazing show. I'm so grateful to have shared this it's time with you, a Rachel. Um, man, myself, Rachel, Mercer Upfitters, make sure you come check them out. Even if it's just to hop in the DMs and just say you were inspired by the show. I appreciate it. You know, do that. Um, Hustle fam, we out. If you twisted, confused, or stuck about trucks, don't be dumb. This is the place to come. Truck and hustle. Let's go.